few months ago, Out Investors approached CDNR and asked us to share some highlights from our diversity inclusion journey with a specific focus on self-disclosure and measuring success. I've been the Director of Talent and Organizational Development at CDNR since 2019. CDNR was formed in 1978, and we are now investing out of our 11th fund, which closed earlier this year at $16 billion. I moved into talent management and organizational development in 2008 after starting my career in consulting. In the early days, I wasn't sure whether I would stay on this career path, but the ability to positively impact people's experience at work and to do that at scale has given my work real meaning. Part of my role, which I really enjoy, is aligning with organizations like Out Investors, which connects me to peers with like-minded missions, allowing all of us to expand our impact. CDNR joined Out Investors in 2020, and since that time, we have made considerable progress along our DNI journey. One milestone that we're really proud of will come this summer when our new associate class begins and nearly 10% of our US investment professionals will identify as a member of the LGBTQ community. Before jumping into specifics on self-disclosure and measuring success, I wanted to take a moment to outline the case for DNI generally. While I realize these points will be nothing new to most of you, this is often where DNI initiatives struggle, getting buy-in from internal stakeholders and rallying around a collective why. So why focus on diversity and inclusion? Here are a few things to consider. First, it supports a high-performance culture. There are countless studies correlating diverse teams to better decision-making, greater innovation, and improved performance across multiple metrics. Second, it advances your talent agenda. Every organization should want to attract the most talented professionals in the industry, irrespective of gender, ethnic heritage, sexual orientation, or gender identity. And finally, our LPs are demanding change. Increasingly, our investors are expecting us to diversify our organizations. So that brings me to the intention of this video. My hope is to share some ideas that support the evolution of self-disclosure and DNI reporting in the private capital industry. While we all know the importance of capturing demographic information, many of the methods for collecting that information are outdated due to a lack of awareness around cultural sensitivities, biases, language preferences, and antiquated systems of distribution. The global workforce has evolved, not only in the way individuals see themselves, but in how they self-identify. Many of the surveys that have circulated within our organizations and our industry no longer reflect the various dimensions of these identities. Harvard Business Review recently pointed out that he and she are no longer the only acceptable pronouns. It is becoming more widely understood that racial and ethnic identities can change across time and space. And that complexity of race and identity deserves more than one catch-all box labeled other. If we can change the way our industry develops, designs, conducts, and delivers surveys, we can begin to create an environment where our workforce feels seen and heard, which over time will allow us to receive more accurate and mature demographic insights. Not only will the integrity of our internal data improve, but we will be able to uncover whether we have differences in our employee experience by demographic group. By improving the experience of all of our colleagues, we will create more brand ambassadors for the industry and, with time, expand our candidate pipeline that has been shrinking for years. Sometimes, instead of surveys, information from documentation, such as an employee's birth certificate, can be used. In other instances, employers may elect to conduct a visual survey. The preferred approach for many, however, is to collect this data through self-identification. Self-identification allows each participant to see themselves. Take, for example, employees with disabilities. Many disabilities are hidden. Communication may help that employee obtain additional support, resources, or adaptations to assist them in performing their job more effectively. And from a regulatory perspective, this allows more accurate reporting in countries with disability quotas, like France, Germany, and Brazil. At the end of the day, we're all humans, and as humans, we want to feel seen, especially by the organizations we work for. So what does survey design look like in practice? If I am gender non-binary and my only options are man, woman, or other, then I'm clearly not represented. 
Even for those who identify as a binary man or woman, merely seeing different options reinforces the message that the organization is inclusive. Additional survey design considerations include not listing potential choices or answers on surveys with one, two, three, or ABC. This can easily feel like ranking or preferencing. Avoid using other as an option. This creates confusion and exclusion. And after all, who wants to be labeled other? Something else I recommend is using open text boxes with prefer to self-describe as a way to tell your employees I understand that identity is complex and not all identities fit into a box. One more tool that you can put to use immediately is leveraging your inclusion committee and your resource groups to review your survey design. Their perspective will certainly enrich the survey experience for all of your employees. The act of collecting information in itself is an opportunity to practice inclusive behaviors. And that's really the goal. I want to encourage you and I want to remind you and your team members of this. You may not get this right on the first try, and even if you do your best, it's going to be hard to please everyone, and that's okay. It's part of the process. What matters most is that you're trying and you're advancing your diversity and inclusion mission in the workplace. In our supplement, we'll provide additional information and suggestions for effective data collection. So when you're ready to send out your updated survey, you'll want to consider the employee experience in your communications campaign because historically underrepresented or marginalized employee groups may not have felt seen or felt that their participation mattered, moving forward, you can consider some new ways to inform and educate people on the benefits of taking these surveys, how the surveys will be delivered, how the insights will be used, and finally, who will see the data. Let your employees know the benefits of filling out the survey for both themselves and for the organization and do your best to make it a positive experience for your employees. As I mentioned before, and it's worth repeating, this will be a journey, but in order to take steps towards creating a more inclusive environment that attracts, retains, and engages top talent, we have to start evolving our methods to capture data, not because we're satisfying a reporting requirement, but because this data generates critical insights that when translated into actions, will evolve our organizations into inclusive, high-performing workplaces in which everyone feels they belong. Please check out our supplement for additional resources that will help you along your journey. Thanks for watching.